So we are live now. Good morning, everyone. I'm Shruti Chatterjee, and I welcome you all to this panel discussion on cultural identity and ideology curated under TMYS Review in association with Center of South Asian Studies, University of Hawaii. Under this theme, TMYS Review March 2023 will explore the role of community appearance and individual presentation in shaping cultural identity and ideology. I would also like to say that we are calling for submissions of stories, essays, and poems, and for project architecture and submission guidelines please visit our website www.tellmeyourstory.biz. Today's topic of discussion is functions of dress in a social context, body dress and identity in ancient India. And we are honored to have with us Utkarsh Patil, Saloni Mahajan and Professor Shantarita Mujundar as our esteemed panelists for this panel discussion. I shall now quickly introduce our speakers. Uh, our first speaker for today is Utkarsh Patil. Utkarsh Patel is a speaker, author, and lecturer on comparative mythology. He writes and speaks on various topics of mythology, both Indian and the world. Besides being an author in the mythological fiction genre, he is also a TEDx speaker and regular speaker at lit fests, colleges, and organizations. Thank you so much for joining us, sir. Next, we Thank have you. Aloni Mahajan. Uh, Saloni Mahajan is an international designer, scholar, curator, and educator. Her experiences including working in the fashion and film industries in Mumbai and Los Angeles. She got her BA honors from Pearl Academy in India, MFA from the University of California, Los Angeles, which trained her in distinct traditional design practices of East and West. Currently, Ms. Mahajan is a doctoral student in the performance studies program at the Department of Theater and Dance, the University of Hawaii. She investigates the costumes, composition, and history of South Asian performances in relation to performance, body, and technology. Thank you so much for joining Thank us, ma'am. Uh, our third panelist, Professor Shantarita Mojundar. Uh, Shantarita Mojundar is currently working as an assistant professor of English at Garden City University, Bangalore. In 2017, she successfully completed her MPhil on rereading Mark Hewitt's women, uh, women, a study of selected character from Ravindra Bharati University, Kolkata. She is an associate editor at Dawn Journal. Her areas of interest are Latin American literature, literary critical theories, postmodernism, memory studies, business communications. Thank you so much for joining us, ma'am. Uh, now, without further delay, we shall start with our today's session. And first, I'd like to request uh, Utkarsh Patel, sir, to present your views on today's topic. Over to you, sir. And I would also like to request to please keep your mics on mute while one is speaking. And over to you, sir. Right. Uh, thanks, you. Thank you uh, uh, for inviting me to speak. Um, when I speak on anything, uh, generally I stick to mythology because I think that's the only subject I understand better than anything else. So ancient culture per se it is not my subject. But let me just talk about the whole idea. The concept of clothing uh, in the ancient times, and when I use the word ancient times, I'm referring to the mythical times and maybe uh, around the epic times, the time that we talk about. That is, in short, I would want to say the ep uh, Vedic and non-Vedic times. Uh, the concept was very, very uh, different from what it is today. And uh, I think clothes were really not the mainstream subject matter. But yes, it definitely was important. And the way I look at it and the way I understand it, there isn't too much of description per se of clothing in uh, mythology. And we found, and uh, whatever little research I've done, is that people dressed more according to the weather. So loose clothing, uh, one single piece of clothing, uh, jewelry, which were not really as refined as we find today or as detailed as we find today. They were clunky. Uh, of course, uh, the preciousness was based on the gems, jewelry, metal, etc. Uh, there were even people who wore uh, uh, jewelry which were made of ordinary metal. Uh, there were also people who wore uh, expensive metals, like I'm talking about gold. Silver, we haven't seen too much of use, though there is a mention of something called white gold. And one presumes that it is uh, silver, though there isn't any mention of silver per se. But yes, we do find uh, silver, we do find gold, we do find a lot of clothing, which are uh, single piece clothing, and I'll talk about it a little later. We do also have, uh, you know, 
clothing like uh, uttariya, uh, an upper garment, a lower garment, which also came in much later. The differences uh, of clothing between men and women was quite limited, to be honest. There was more around draping. There was more around, about covering. And yes, in certain regions, there is a mention of woolen clothing. Uh, we haven't come across much of fur except in one reference, which I think we'll talk as we move further. So clothing, yes, there has been some reference about it, but we find very general discussion on clothing. And yes, as we go further and as we talk about myths and epics, we will see that there is some mention of certain kind of clothing. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. It was very interesting to hear you speak. Next, I'd like to request uh, Saloni Mahajan to present your views on today's topic. Over to you, ma'am. Perfect. First of all, thank you so much again for inviting me. Um, and my views, again, I am a costume designer. I have, and I have been working in the fashion industry. So I have pretty much um, thought and discussed about this quite a lot, but I mostly work on contemporary designs as well. So ancient India is a topic which is very dear to my heart. Uh, I love to read and uh, research about history. So it was it was it is great to be a part of uh, this panel. Um, I would just like to say we all wake up, we get dressed every day of our lives. Clothing and style is one of the main ways by which an individual expresses their personal identities and their culture. This is a shared medium of expression around the world that people engage in. Dress absolutely fulfills the basic human need for protection, but also gives the opportunity to be creative while acclimating oneself to environment, social conditions, and adorning oneself using ornaments and clothing called alankar or adornments and shingar has existed since antiquity and people in India have embraced this tradition to date, not only to cover and protect the body, but also as auspicious iconographic symbols, whether seen in adorned frozen sculptures and paintings on performers in everyday life on for ceremonial rituals, people relish the practice of adorning oneself. Uh, dress communicates the details of one's personality, it informs about one's occupation, community, social status, gender, age, sense of style, and personality. Especially in India, it varies from region to region, whether it is difference in how a woman's sari or a man's dhoti is wrapped, the cut of the design, the use of headdresses head, uh, uh, and the fabric, or the use of temporary or per permanent body markings, dress and adornments inform it all. As a costume designer, we actually use these tools and functions to create authentic characters for street, stage, or screen, for audience to believe into those characters. We use these functions of dress to transform actors into different characters for the audience to look at them and believe in it. Even before a narrative begins, we know a lot about the character just looking at their uh, personal appearance because of these identity markers. Whoever the actor might be in those costumes in a narrative dressed like a character, he or she is believed to be the, the new person. So I'm glad TMYS chose to take this as one of the topics to be discussed. Clothing often isn't given enough attention within acad academia. Um, I specialize in performance studies, and uh, there's limited research that has been published about costumes and dress as a part of performance making. My research actually focuses on costumes and the body to explore how clothing bridges the gap between the wearer on the actor and the viewer, the, our audience. I explored how dress is uh, in a performance gives the actor the opportunity to disappear into the character and enables their body to be dislocated and changed. Um, I focus on dress as a transformative connection between actor and the character where dressing room or fitting rooms are the liminal space. Especially when we talk about body dress and identity, dress can be approached as an inclusive umbrella for investigating contemporary as well as historical bodies caught in the act of appearance. There are so many areas to explore within uh, Indian culture, the agency of clothing within everyday life, rituals, performances, the performativity of clothing, how clothing helps the process of self-defining, assuring and stabilizing one's orientation, heritage, roles. Dress is a form of representation. 
also it's a, it's it is uh, helpful to discover political agency of these clothes that can be an executor of political activism interrogate social norms and social contexts where dress can be seen as a space and portrayal of culture connect communities display gender race cultural identity and more as this panel kind of focuses more on body dress and identity in ancient india i can give an example of my latest research that was my first time getting into the world of art history uh, as a part of my fellowship last summer i curated an exhibition on devi uma parveshwari who was widely worshiped as the consort of shiva during the chola dynasty she was celebrated as the bride wife and mother in her more fierce forms uma's uh, various manifestations as seen in chola bronze sculptures by durga mahishasur mardani kali bhadra kali nishumbh sudani artists created various statues for their patrons and worshippers for use in temples and in large processions during festivals the exhibition compiled bronze sculptures of uma as consort and autonomous goddess from tanjore district uh, the heart of chola empire during the 10th and 11th centuries the exhibition on it is right now displayed on the virtual museum of image and sound focused on the sculpture as a part of larger stories where artists made the body of the deity with specific ornament costumes gait and posture to suggest an attitude appropriate to the narrative again these costumes and adornments and postures and gait kind of informed about the social context um so even though the exhibition mostly focused on costumes and ornament uh, it reflected the style of dressing of the chola dynasty as well uh, it it's kind of um, how those bronzes kind of focused on the uh, the chola dynasty something that i'm researching on now uh, however it uh, the exhibition displayed the goddess's posture garments uh, ornaments and how it changed her identity uh, how as she was wife in the chola kingdom her iconography is relatively consistent she stands in a graceful tribhanga posture with her right hand raised to hold a lotus uh, while her other hand gracefully contours her body and when she is the bride she is richly adorned she she stands uh, very she's portrayed as very young she stands shy next to shiva whereas when she is durga she is in her more fierce form uh instead of tribhanga pose she is more in sambhanga pose uh and her ornaments and costumes change as kali it's completely different when she there's this one sculpture where this obviously they, her hair uh, rises in a halo and her breastplate actually shows serpentine and this uh, across the sacred cord and there's uh, across the sacred cord there are human skulls threaded in it so we absolutely find these small little details in costumes and ornaments that my uh, that my exhibition kind of explores um it is more extensive uh, i would i would suggest you all to go see it on uh, virtual museum of image and sound it's called changing uh, changing iconography uh, changing identity and uh, this is just an example of how costumes and ornaments plays a huge part uh, in terms of functions in social context uh, and even in ancient india uh and uh, how even as today we do have these different identities that we're dressing ourselves in these different roles so um this is how i would like to start i am very excited to discuss with everybody uh in this panel thank you thank you so much it was very brilliant presentation and uh, next i would like to request a uh, professor shanjoita mojunda to present her views on today's topic good morning all and uh, i take it as a privilege to be uh, invited in such an excellent panel uh, that is function of dress in social context uh, in with respect to ancient india now i believe that when we are talking about ancient india we'll be talking about all the historical uh, figures from the chola time or maybe like uh, times when i you or none of uh, us were there a reference to which we get only from our ancient textbooks maybe from epics from the poems that are there that has existed or from the uh, you know the uh, the temple uh, from the temples the olden temples or maybe from the stone engravings that we see so are uh, talking about uh, you know dressing in ancient india or how it has developed how it has formed an identity uh, i will just uh, speak from the point of view of literature uh, when i think of ancient dressing style or ancient uh, dress forming our identity 
I would uh, refer back to the Ramayana or the Mahabharata and also with respect to what we represented Mahabharata and Ramayana on screen. Uh, very recently when we uh, came across, because there's a revival of Indian myth, Indian uh, epic uh, texts, uh, a lot of historical uh, drama uh, on screen as well as um, through uh, literature and novels have come up recently in the last uh, five years. Uh, so I'll be talking from that uh, aspect. I remember uh, the representation of Karina Kapoor in a, a movie, Ashoka, wherein uh, she was in love interest of King Ashoka and the way she was represented that led to a lot of... Uh, newspaper articles and all and in fact uh, people were uh, going to the theaters to watch her representation on screen where she has been projected in quite skimpy clothes and uh, and uh, th that is how women during that period of time was represented according to the motion picture at the, uh, Ashoka. However, coming to Padmavat, if we if we speak about that, that beautiful uh, dressing with lots of ornaments and uh, jewelry. And I remember after uh, Padmavat had uh, come on screen, there were, uh, you know, a lot of uh, imitations of uh, Deepika Padukone's uh, dress on the Internet. I remember there were reels that were made. I also remember people trying to imitate that dress, people trying to buy jewelries. And also during some of the festivities, such kind of jewelries became very much in vogue. So uh, if we think of ancient India, as I said, none of us were there at that point of time. I believe, first of all, clothing, uh, if we talk about clothing during that point of time, it would be much of uh, something intriguing, something that we would love to explore, something that we don't know and something that we would love to bring it uh, in 2022 uh, or maybe in the future. So when we uh, talk about the social identity that... Uh, was formed during that period of time, I believe a, a lot depended on the availability of resources uh, uh, for those people during that point of time, what they had with them and how they could, uh, you know, uh, make clothing out of it. Availability of resources is not really like today wherein we can get anything and everything we want uh, in 10 minutes time. So uh, for them, it was much, it was more of uh, that necessity, obviously, to cover oneself. Also, to ensure that one's uh, gender is reflected through the clothing is what I believe. And very importantly, also to uh, represent those uh, stereotypical uh, gender, uh, you know, roles that were assigned to them. If you look back into some texts, uh, Ram or say uh, an epical text of Ramayana or Mahabharata, uh, uh, I'll, I'll talk about Mahabharata first, that very instance where Draupadi is robbed of her uh, clothing and how Krishna comes in and she uh, there's an unending um, sari saga that goes on that practically leads to the Mahabharata uh, war. So uh, sari being that, uh, you know, that enigma, that, uh, that symbol of femininity, that symbol of, uh, say, you can say something that uh, portrays who you are and what you are uh, and how that has to be protected no matter whatever happens. Now, coming to Ramayana, again, if you see when uh, Ram and uh, Sita and Lakshman go off, to the, uh, uh, go, uh, go off to the jungles to stay for this 14 years, they have to... Uh, leave behind the luxuries of the palace and they have to be dressed in very uh, simple, plain, simple clothing and very plain, simple colors as well. Also, the choice of colors, again, something that we have seen in pictures and in motion pictures is what I'll be talking about. Sita draped maybe in a, a saffron colored a sari or a whitish uh, sari. So that simplicity should be uh, you know, should convey through them because they would be leaving the uh, life not of kings and queens, but a very simple life in the jungles, uh, in nature. So I believe uh, during that period of time, if we talk about uh, clothing, it was much of necessity and representation, which is very uh, same today itself as well. Today, maybe uh, clothing is much more about Instagram and Facebook. We dress according to, uh, you know, Instagram and Facebook. That is how the culture has changed. But then during that period of time, they had to take up whatever was with them. So if so gold is not something that my kingdom or my place would have in uh, abundance, I have to stick to some other metal. But then metal is something not just in Indi ancient India, but if you look into across the uh, globe in any any ancient cultures, metal is something that, 
is very popular uh, when it comes to dressing, be it men or be it women. And I would just conclude with one, uh, you know, one uh, sentence like uh, with respect to contemporary dressing, I believe ancient uh, dressing in India was uh, much more uh, extravagant than uh, today's because uh, the way things have changed people wanting you know loose clothing very casual dressing I believe at that period of time it was more about a show you had to represent yourself your kingdom your people your culture so it was much more extravagant so uh, maybe it's it is because uh, language was not much developed I'm not sure but then it had to be a show in front of people so yeah I'm, I'm excited to to be part of this panel and we shall discuss more on this thank you so much for this informative presentation ma'am so with this we now move on to our question and answer round for today's segment and my first question is for Utkar, Utkarsh Patel sir and my first question to you is uh, why do you think nudity and short outfits look down upon in Indian culture when ancient Indian women used to wear a single piece of cloth to cover their bodies, as we find from, from temple sculptures? Over to you, sir. Right. So as I said earlier also that, you know, in the ancient times, people often dressed as per the weather. And uh, of course, uh, like uh, Shanchaita just now said, that regional differences were important because regional differences also were based on the weather. So how you dress is often depending on the region. And of course, the weather was important. And what we've seen is that often men and women often had a very similar sense of clothing. That is one long cloth draped around. If you look, if you have a, take a quick look at the temple carvings or any old carvings, you will see that the upper area coverings were minimal. And that was probably the normal part of living. You know, uh, uh, there was never any, any, any taboo, at least in the ancient times as we see it. For a brief period, Indian women didn't even wear a blouse underneath their saris. Uh, much later, uh, you know, even during the colonial times, certain people did not wear it and certain castes, uh, this was also a little bit of a caste base, were either not allowed to wear an upper clothing or did not wear it. And uh, 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 even, even women from the elite class of Bengal wore saris, uh, you know, without the blouse. The whole idea of modesty, you know, based on dressing, I think came much later, you know, after the uh, Mughals started coming into India, uh, who actually brought in the two-piece of clothing concept, you know, the upper clothing and the lower clothing. The two-piece clothing actually, to quite an extent, the defined way of uh, uh, wearing clothes was actually, uh, you know, uh, introduced by them, followed, of course, by the English, who were actually scandalized to see no upper garment uh, uh, on a woman's body. Dressing changed a lot, you know, after, uh, you know, these two uh, set of people started coming in and started making standards of dressing, which resulted in a very, very significant uh, historic event, you know, where Rabindranath Tagore's uh, sister-in-law, uh, Gyananda Nondini Devi, who was not allowed to enter a club because she was not wearing a blouse. And thereafter, it is believed that it was she who designed the whole idea of a blouse with long sleeves and uh, frills and even the, uh, yeah, I don't know what's it called, but even the balloon uh, kind of a thing, uh, sleeve were introduced and of course later on the Brahmo uh, Samaj took it over and they started designing uh, as an upper garment which was basically the blouse. I think measuring one's character uh, and the standards of morality depending on the dressing style is a much later phenomenon. I'm not saying recent but I'm saying a much later phenomenon from that and this is thanks to people who actually came to do business with us uh, but decided to stay back and rule over us. So the whole idea that culture, you know, uh, uh, you know, it was it, it, the whole dressing concept was never a part of sanskar as it seems to have become now. Uh, and I, I, I personally feel that the Victorian traditions is now so strongly ingrained in us that a lot of our dressing sensibilities, understanding, and judgment about others is thanks to them. Thank you so much, sir. And my next question is for Saloni Mahajan. And my question is to you, ma'am. 
style of clothing varies from from culture to culture and community to community could you shed some light on the motivations behind the desires of individuals as well as the institutions in getting certain types of dresses designed and constructed over to you ma'am thank you uh, and i would first like to start with uh, absolutely i totally agree with uh, what akash was saying uh, in terms of ha- mo- modesty and that being a big part of of the way people have dressed since the antiquity till today and uh, i totally uh, agree that the idea of modesty and what it actually was was entirely different and it has been entirely different through the ages um so definitely dress and style in india have been like colorful and thrilling and it's like this endless fascinating subject with uh, absolutely uh, i i think all of us could keep researching about it and there'll be imp- in endless uh, research that we could do and uh, the dress have taken their own shape form according to absolutely like we already mentioned about climate uh and for uh, obviously people wore it for environmental protection for social and political change to ex- uh, to express decoration gender differentiation group membership ceremonialism uh, sexual enhancement and more and uh, dress of people from age to age present a vital clue to their social and economic conditions their mood and taste their aesthetic temper their love for beauty uh, and refinement their art skill to adjust to the material geographical environment their resourcefulness resilience to influences external and uh, and internal and the way of their living uh, especially when it comes to why these uh, culture culture and community to community in the style of clothing has been very different is absolutely because of the vast span of indian territory uh, and its long history which gives us extremely different diverse uh, traditions and styles of clothing that have changed and still keeps changing according to taste and utility um and yet these styles are um, tied to the ancient traditions and also are influenced by the outer world as we've already been discussing so when you ask about motivation absolutely is dependent on geography and climate india's a vast subcontinent with himalayas in the north it's, it has lush uh, lush rainforest it has desert it has warm and southern uh, climate in the southern part of india there's a huge diverse landmass and obviously different weather conditions the clothing textiles and construction today is obviously we uh, are very different uh, from place to place to p- keep individuals comfortable it also kind of depends on the material uh, available in that area uh and uh and especially when it comes to performances uh there are traditions where people actually use use the resources not even only for performances but in everyday life the way we dress ourselves and uh, uh everything is also dependent upon what the availability of material is around that area um another aspect of creating identity especially in india and sometimes people try to set themselves apart from the crowd using dress and most often they blend into the community and clothing is definitely a non verbal communicator of social and political attitudes and in terms of when it comes to india religious clothing and personal appearance is an important aspect of dress and identity individuals and groups in india display their uh, re- religious observance through attire including the use of special clothing jewelry and other aspects of personal appearance so dress is actually a cultural visual a mirror of the time and the people uh, on the one hand it is the imitation of the old on the other hand it's adjustment to new needs tastes and circumstances this is how culture lives regulates rejuven- rejuvenates uh, itself from time to time so style of clothing does vary from culture to culture and community to community and there are endless possibilities for the reason and with the diversity in india that and that's the beauty of the nation where people their styles of clothing their traditions their languages their culture culture ethnicities change for every few miles so i think we we're, we're just embracing that uh, and i i continue to absolutely research about this thank you thank you so much ma'am and my next question is for professor santreeta mojundar and ma'am uh, my question to you is could you shed some light on the religious significance of clothes worn in ancient times in india over to you ma'am yeah Right. Thank you, Shruti, for the question. Now, uh, talking about uh, religious, right? Is the religious significance? 
yeah so now uh, i would like to uh, focus not just on ancient india again i'll just talk about how culture has been carried from the ancient times uh, till date a uh, belonging from a bengali community uh, and uh, if i remember again uh, i'll take the tagorean reference if you uh, if if you read about tagore's women their a sense of dressing was not very much different from what i may have seen my uh, grand uh, mothers doing it so it would have a very typical way of draping the sari and as very rightly said by utkarsh for a very longer period of time that uh, upper or uh, top or uh, you know blouse or whatever you call that was not really there so even if you see chokherwali by uh, you know that uh, movie if you see where ashwarya is uh, uh, you know the main character she does not have that clothing however the uh, wife of this uh, you know I, i just completely forgot the name i'm sorry for that however that zamindar's wife would have that piece of clothing again if you look into indian tribal culture again if you if you go back in the history you will see tribal women w- would not have that that piece of clothing and they would have again a very typical way of draping the sari it would be very simple and done quickly now i believe that uh, obviously came from a very professional uh, say convenience wherein you would quickly drape your sari and you would be on your toes because as you have seen i am sure you know that tribal women would be very hard working in comparison to you know any women during that period of time coming to the religious sentiments and all i have always seen a uh, white as that choice of sari when it comes to religious patterns in india white uh, signifying peace or signifying serenity you will find white even on idol would be uh, dressed in white although i'm sure that we see you know uh, goddess durga uh, being draped in uh, colors and all but then what we offer to her will be a white uh, sari with a red border now white representing uh, obviously purity but also it has other cultural significance it signifies a uh, virginity as well it signifies purity as well that concept of virginity and purity is why white is normally a what a woman would be draped into and during all of these you know ancient if you go back and if you look into that ancient festivities and all the preference of color would be white again i'll take uh, that uh, from bengal i'll come to the southern part i did not have much uh, you know experience in the western part or maybe the northern part but coming to the southern part now that i am living in the southern part of india for last 5 years again that choice of white and not and and trust me it's without any colors they would uh, you know they would uh, choose a plain white maybe with a golden border sometimes but then again that concept of gold since down south gold is something that is very popular amongst uh, women amongst men as well even you will find men and women choosing very simple length of clothes for men they would just drape it into a dhoti during uh, the festivities for women they would drape it into a, a common uh, sari pattern but then draping obviously changes from uh, culture to culture from region to region but coming to festivities i would like to stick to this point that for festivities i guess in india ancient india people would go for very simple colors something that would uh, you know uh, something that would uh, represent that serenity that uh, peace that purity and all uh even if you, if you look into how pandits would be uh, uh the the clothing of the pandits or the one who is performing the puja you would find them they would be draped in white dhoti so uh talking about and that has not much changed uh, and in fact i believe that uh, from ancient india till date religious dressing is something that is quite constant it is not something that has gone through a massive change obviously we do break traditions wherein uh, we do uh, you know in my house itself i am the one who is doing all all of these it's okay but then coming to dressing again i would be choosing a sari over maybe a jeans or a top when i'm doing a puja or uh, you know any kind of religious uh, activities so uh, from ancient time i think we have preserved we have conserved and we had picked up those beautiful uh, things again flowers flowers are very important when it comes to dressing be it the western part of india eastern part or southern part flowers uh, in the hair of women or flowers you know when you are garlanding yourself that is something again is a part of uh, dressing a very major part of dressing rather 
choice of flowers again depends uh, and differs from region to region while i believe uh, in the eastern part it's more of yellow and red flowers when you come down south it's more of white jasmine flower is the choice but then that also is a major part of dressing when it comes to religious uh, dressing in ancient india as well as till date it is the same uh, i believe i have answered your question shruti Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Definitely. Yeah. And thank you so much for your answer. And my next question is for Sir Utpush Patel, sir. And my question to you is: uh, to fully understand and appreciate an age gone by, we need to know what people looked like, where they lived, and most importantly, where they were. So, based on your book, could you define the fashion of ancient India and its cultural importance in today's modern society? Over to you, sir. right i'm facing a little bit of a disturb uh, the net uh, yes sir. shall i repeat the question audible yes no no yes, I, i i understood i lost you somewhere in between so um, let me just delve in on this part three then i'll talk about the epic times and then i'll move on to the sangam period uh, these are, i'm just going to divide that partly into Uh, three ways so like I, like i mentioned earlier also that the garments worn during the uh, earlier times was definitely on the weather but the vedic period included majority of the cases in the vedic times they included a single cloth which was wrapped around the whole body and uh, draped mainly over the shoulder uh, people used to wear the lower garment which was pleated in front and an upper garment which was generally referred to as the uttariya and uh, in in uh, orthodox male and females usually wore the uttariya by throwing it uh, either over the shoulder or uh, sometimes even around depending on the weather once again uh, and there was a separate garment which they used to wear when it was uh, cold sometimes uh, the way the dhoti or the lower garment was worn is also dependent was dependent on the kind of people so if people were poor uh, the dhoti would be pulled up like uh, a loin cloth okay while the wealthy people would wear it till their ankles so uh, so that would also show the class of the people uh, depending on both the uh, you know uh, affluence and uh, uh, how poor they were rigved does mention uh, you know a few kind of clothing which was the outer cover which is the veil and they would also talk about the head ornament and even a headdress which today we understand as a turban and and these turbans could be worn in different styles depending on uh, either the status of the person the region of course and there was also evidence of uh, ornaments which were worn by both men and women in ears neck they were either made of gold they were made of beads and if we go down south we'll even see they were made of shells so uh, as i said earlier also there wasn't much reference of uh, silver of course but in those days silver was really not called silver it was even referred to as the uh, white gold atharva ved also mentions about certain kind of clothing and we also find mention of footwear and blanket especially for wearing and uh, footwear again uh, a special mention of footwear has been meant uh, there even during the vedic times we find the plain uh, when i use the word plain i'm referring to uh, simple clothing plain and sometimes even coarse not as refined as we understand today was probably the norm not necessarily across a uh, uh, hierarchy but that was the norm and headgear again uh, how you wear it depending on the one who's working on the field and one who's uh, you know in the higher echelons of the society the headgear would change however we find a more defined mention of clothing when we talk about the epics mahabharat has mention of silk fabrics which has been brought to yudhishthir during uh, the rajasuya yagya from the himalayan region so the princes who came from the himalayan region brought in silk for him in mahabharat we also find a mention of printed cloth and i am though not very sure about it but probably this is probably one of the early mentions of printed cloth which was also known as uh chitra vastra uh, which means it had prints in it and it was referred to as then uh, later on it might have been evolved into something else there is also a reference in mahabharat of something called mani chira mani chira is basically some kind of a fabric which had uh, 
you know, which had pearls or jewels woven in on the fringes of the cloth. So you see how clothing, we seem to be, we, we find them evolving as we move on time. Uh, in Valmiki's Ramayana, there is a mention of the trousseau of uh, Sitas, which had silk in it, which had woolen clothing in it, which even had fur and precious clothing uh, in it. And of course, there were different ornaments and uh, different kind of ornaments was also mentioned. In both the epics, we find three kinds of clothing. One is the veil, which is an outer covering. Then there is an inner uh, garment, which is uh, a tight clothing, uh, more to a kind of an undergarment kind of a thing, but it was worn inside, and a looser upper garment. This was also common uh, for grooms and brides to wear during the wedding. And, uh, and in Ramayana, there are numerous references, again, we find of printed cloth. Again, when we go to uh, Sri Lanka, in uh, again in the case of uh, Ramayan, we find that the ladies of Ravan's uh, court or in Lanka, there was a reference of multicolored clothing. So very clearly, uh, there is a reference of people wearing clothes of different colors. So there's a whole concept of multicolor and printed carpets, printed blankets and printed dresses, which were distributed as gifts uh, in uh, Ravan's court. So we see clothing literally changing. When we go down south, and this reference of the south clothing is found mainly from the Sangam literature, owing to the uh, you know the uh, hot or the heat or the uh, you know warmth in the in the weather, there was a difference in the clothing, and uh, we also see minimal clothing, uh, and the upper upper uh, body in many of the cases, both for men and women, was often left bare. Rules of modesty, nudity, clothing, they were very, very general and uh, quite often we've seen, uh, you know, gender neutral also. People from lower economic communities dressed only in lower garments and accessories that they might have were either made of flowers, uh, uh, leaves, coconut fiber and even animal hair. I'm again coming back to the idea of fur was there. By the time we touch uh, Sangam and Sangam works refer and Interestingly, some of the major Sangam works uh, in terms of literature have uh, reference of uh, ornaments. For example, the uh, Chivaka Chintamani, uh, that's one of the uh, uh, lit literary pieces, talks of jewelry on forehead. Or the Kundalakeshi, again, stud on the ear. Mani Mekalai, uh, you know, the number two important uh, epic, uh, talks of girdle on the waist. Uh, Vyalapati, bangle, uh, and of course, Silapati Karam, the anklet. So jewelry in Sangam literature has been very elaborate and quite detailed. So besides jewelry, people gave a lot of attention to hairstyling. So part of the clothing is not just clothes and uh, ornaments. We're even talking about, we're even talking about hair, uh, hairstyling. And the ancient people, the ancient Davidians of the times wore flowers, like I think Shanchoita mentioned about jasmine. Uh, and that was very common down south. And um, they decorated their plates, uh, used perfumes made of sandalwood and uh, sandal flowers also. So people also commonly wore ornaments which were made of beads. And I mentioned shells, which were also very common. Now, uh, very clearly, Silapati Karam mentions the reference of two women, two main women, that is Kandagi and Madhavi, uh, often was mentioned that they only wore the lower garment from waist downwards, and of course, anklets. And uh, there are me no mention of an, uh, they're wearing an upper garment. So both these uh, women, who are the main characters of Silapati Karam, have uh, references of elaborate dressing, but sometimes there is no upper garment. So as I said, it was a norm probably, and um, of not covering the torso, which wasn't judged, which wasn't uh, you know seen as immodest or uh, anything uh, which would scandalize people. Thank you so much, sir. And my next question is for Saloni Mahajan, ma'am. And my question to you is, performances have been an Im important aspect of social interaction and social change in Indian since antiquity. How do you think clothing and style as costumes create identities within performances? Over to you, ma'am. Um, as we all are discussing about this and we're all mentioning performances today or performances of the past and uh, narratives and stories. So we absolutely can see how performances uh, and these narratives and stories have, have always been a 
huge social interaction uh within people uh, around people and in a social context uh and clothing has has been mentioned in literature in these narratives have we've seen them uh, how how in in movies today or in in performances today how we inf- get in, get influenced by them or interpret them has been a huge part uh, of our of our culture and our society and costuming and costuming obviously as a kash kind of mentioned as as including clothing dress fragrances accessorizing body decoration hair uh, changing kind of like anything that kind of manipulates the physical appearance including all of that uh costume uh is uh is a is a huge part of this these performances and the process of studying who and what these characters are in our script so even when we are mentioning these these films today uh and or mythological stories of the past we're kind of we're t- kind of talking about these these people and these characters that we that we dress them and we've we've uh, studied in history so in, in these character description costume plays an important role because what the audience sees gives a more immediate impression of who the character is than uh, than what he or she says that is what the uh, what the uh, before even what the audience hears uh when we look at uh, a character on screen stage or street we definitely know who that person is or uh, who that person's kind of portraying and uh, consequently costume naturally gives a form of expression about an individual either of his or her social status culture religion profession sex age and so on it it reflects the daily life of people because it is closely related with the festivities culture pleasure fashion and basic practices uh this ability of dressing to make an impression about the wearer or uh, or the audience or the onlooker is even more profound in performances because once a character appears on stage or screen the audience instantly begins to interpret the character by what they see on on the on the character in this respect costume performs a primary role in helping the audience understand the character as well as his or her cultural background so this is uh and this is absolutely an important aspect when it comes to dress and its social context since antiquity to today as you mentioned uh it has existed absolutely and as as a costume designer myself as i mentioned before these are the tools and these identity markers are what we actually use to create these affected effective characters for screen or stage that we're all discussing right now uh also kind of talking about uh when we're talking about performances it performances also include um uh political influ- uh performances where uh where in terms of we we kind of take sides or we we color and the way we dress in our daily lives we're also like making these statements but also when we're discussing performances the major part of what we absolutely need to discuss is the dance drama of india and the classical performances and kind of how costuming has been a huge part of that as well which which has been mentioned in literature uh which has been which we see till today and that has also uh changed over time again uh like i kind of mentioned before this is a huge topic that absolutely couldn't can be discussed in many other panels but definitely um performances and uh and costuming is a huge part of indian culture and uh that is that as costume designers we're definitely researching about right now thank you Thank you so much, ma'am. And my next question is for Professor Shantarita Mujundar. Uh, so my question is: the psychological association between poverty and the lack of elegance results in ignoring those whose sense of dressing may not appeal to urban aesthetic sensibilities. Could you shed some light on the urban aesthetic functions of the clothes and its relevance to Indian society? Over to you, ma'am. yeah thank you uh, shruti so talking about uh, the socio economical uh, difference and the uh, sense of clothing as i had uh, mentioned uh, in the previous question itself like if you look into tribal women 
the way they would be dressed and in the same way the you know the upper section of the society obviously would not be dressed but then coming to the aesthetic sense i think uh, even for those who would not be uh, economically so, you know economically strong would find their sense of aesthetic aestheticism rather um, in their dressing through maybe ornaments like flowers uh, made of made out of flowers or leaves and all if you look into uh, the lora section of the society or if you read epics and all you would find that even in their dressing there was a very subtle way of projecting who they were their identity as well in fact that uh, you know that uh, uh, differed from different uh, places and uh, uh, cultures as well like uh, if uh, if one particular culture would choose one particular flower as their uh, way of dressing the other culture would choose something else but coming to urban uh, sense of aestheticism um, i believe if you look uh, look at dressing today it may seem like uh, you know something that is farce but then torn jeans something that was not really into fashion something that is associated with you being poor like if you read uh, the you know economically um, weaker section of the uh, people if you read about them you would find torn clothes uh, hardly having one cloth that they would drape every single day in fact uh, you know washing that single piece of clothing every day and then waiting for it to dry and then draping the same thing uh, now in in today in 2022 uh urfi yadav if you see her sense of dressing she is very much into news and which is why i had to take it up because uh, can we really distinguish between what is uh, being poor and what is being rich because she has made a dressing out of set pins and also even a, a wire so uh, going back in ancient times or maybe how uh, you know clothes have uh, put in that aesthetic sense i think a lot depends on our communities or an individual's sense of uh, what is beauty and uh, even during uh, you know olden times although a raja or a rani would be dressed in uh, huge turbans or maybe gold and uh, lots of jewelries and uh, a beautiful blend of silk uh, sarees and silk clothing but uh, th- those who would belong to the lower section of the society they would also be dra- draped in uh, clothes uh, uh, made out of cotton but they would be beautiful as well so in their ways of dressing they would have that aesthetic sense which may not always uh, cater to what is is beauty to me or what is beauty to you and beauty i believe very strongly is a very subjective thing so uh, as i said like that torn jeans or ripped jeans however you call it wherein you hardly have a piece of uh, cloth uh, hanging on your trouser that uh, may not symbolize pov- poverty because you may be buying that piece of uh, jean for maybe uh, like 10000 bucks but at the same time that may have been a piece of clothing for a beggar out on the street who is wearing that same kind of you know that same uh, dressing uh, um, in, in that same kind of attire that same representation so urban sense of aesthetic is very subjective and if i say urban uh, it not really varies from the rural uh, space as well again if you go back there maybe the difference would be in the material that i'm using the difference may be the kind of jewelry that i am uh, using like if i'm using a diamond somebody else will be using a copper ring that's it otherwise i believe uh, during olden times as very rightly pointed out by utkarsh as well as saloni there was not very much difference in how you would uh, you know it was all about representing yourself your community your culture it was not much of like uh, you know i'm i'm carrying a gucci and you do not have you are carrying a second hand of gucci or something like that that was not really so uh, that socio economical difference i believe has uh, swept into the uh, you know uh, uh, in our culture maybe during the world war 1 and 2 and when we became very conscious about our own uh, economical status but during olden times it was more of a community representation it was more of a cultural representation rather than i believe uh, a socio economical uh, representation yeah that should be it shruti thank you thank you so much ma'am so with this we now come to the end of our today's session i would once again like to say that we are calling for submissions of stories essays and poems and for project architecture and submission guidelines please visit our website www.tellmeyourstory.biz i extend a heartfelt thank you 
to Utkarsh Patil, uh, Saloni Mahajan, ma'am, and Sanchaita Mojinda, ma'am, for this wonderful and remarkable session. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank, Thank you. you.